lunch. Uh, how are we feeling, everyone? Hmm, busy. A lot of talking happening, a lot of chatting. So welcome back, everyone. Glad to have you here with me. I have two jokes. Where is the jokes guy? Right there. Excellent. Jokes department is supporting it. Are you ready for them? Anybody? Oh, maybe I should do the chocolate first. That seems to be working a bit better. Let me do the chocolate first. So, I mean, you maybe had already something, but I need to get rid of those, right? So, I would need your consent yet again. Do throw things. Here we go. We'll have more of that later. So this is what you're excited about, huh? not the jokes. This is what you're excited about. All right, two jokes. Two jokes I have prepared. You can laugh, but you don't have to. Ready? Okay, well, you can always uh, tell me to stop, right, if you don't like them. It's not like you have to suffer, you know, through this. So, ready? Yeah? Okay. So, what did the sea say to the sand? Oh, now everybody's listening. Nothing, it just waved. Mm, okay. Not too good, not too good. Sorry about that. I have another one though. Oh, this is really bad. I mean, this is a really bad one. I found it on the internet, right? So, what do you call a bee that lives in America? A USB? Mm, yeah, okay, maybe I should stop. I don't know. Doesn't seem like it's, it's working, but you know, yeah, it will come to you. It will take a while. Okay? You, tomorrow when you come back to work, you're like, I had this joke, right? So maybe it will come to you. All right. <laughs> now, moving on to the next talk. Uh, we're going to speak about emotional technology. And I'm very, very happy to have with us Ilya. Ilya, please come on stage. No need to be shy. All works? Excellent. Hello. Hello, Ilya. Uh, Ilya is a product and custom experience designer and entrepreneur, uh, living, uh, well, also partly living here in Tel Aviv, but also in London, as you told me. So you're jumping back and forth. Half and half, more or less. So what is it going to be, London or Tel Aviv? I, I like to keep both, I think, for time being. Then we'll see. Rome is also very appealing. Okay, okay. <laughs> well, um, also Ilya has worked on a number of physical and digital products all around the world. Uh, founder and executive chairman of the Strelka Institute of Media, which I'm really a big fan of. We'll have to talk Thank about you. it a bit later. And he's also involved in a number of startups as an investor and all. But really, you are interested these days about technology, what is happening in digital, and also about emotional technology. So I'm very, very uh, excited to hear what you have to say. So everyone, please give a round, warm, warm welcome and applause to Ilya Oskok of Tsensipa. So I'll, the way I prefer to do it is uh, I'll just share some, some thoughts and uh, really I prefer to, to do it in dialogue because I always think that if you have a uh, sort of a well-rehearsed speech, why don't you just put it on YouTube and save everyone the trouble of uh, traveling elsewhere. So I'll just throw in something and then we'll, uh, uh, we'll talk. A uh, couple of words about myself. I, I guess most of you are engaged with digital design in one form or the, or the other. Uh, I know a little bit about how to do it, but uh, I, I have been designing all sorts of things. The largest thing uh, I ever designed is a new city, which I can't unfortunately talk about because it's completely nd 8 but believe me, it's there, and hopefully it will be built. The smallest thing I designed uh, is, is a number of apps. I do it not alone, but with a number of my colleagues who actually know who do each single one of these things better than, the, the, than I do, so which gives me the, the wonderful opportunity of switching from one field to the other, and also learning things uh, in, uh, in different domains of design and bringing them to, to, to different things. So I want to talk about a little bit about what, from my point of view, an, an next big challenge for 
for us as designers and custom experience creators and what, uh, what will keep this field uh, interesting, at least for me, in the, uh, in the next several years or probably more. As designers, we are normally asked to do one of the two things. One is to, to make something comfortable, uh, easy to use, uh, uh, and so on. The, what could be easier to use than, than a voice interface, for example, you say, make it make it hotter, make it calmer, and it changes the, changes the temperature <coughs> the temperature in the room. And we, you know, we're moving, moving forward there and getting it done better and better. The other thing we know how to do, or at least the best of us know how to do, is to how to make uh, things more pleasant, how it creates this, this little moments of uh, uh, fun and nicety and cu overall cuteness. And this is mostly what designers are engaged with. One is how to make things more comfortable, and another one is how to make things more pleasant. Of all the human emotions, uh, pleasantness and comfort represent just a tiny little slice, which is in red, in red here, and I wonder how we can design the rest of it. All the other emotions which are out there, which we were not called to design because I guess capitalism starts with making things uh, a bit more comfortable and a bit more pleasant, but will be, I think, pushed forward by the development of the technology itself to engage with other more complex, more troublesome emotions uh, uh, sometimes. And so I think that this is where the, the, the interesting things to learn lie. If we briefly look at the, uh, at the history of how the digital technology was developing, it started with creating value in the fields where no one was actually seeing value before. Like flirt, for example. Flirt existed forever. People were chatting to each other and trying to, to, to look sexy to one another. But Facebook and all the other social media things, remember Facebook, probably not all of you remember that, but it started basically as a campus, campus applications for boys and girls and all the others on the campus to, uh, to look nicer to one another. No one could make a lot of money out of flirt before. Facebook and others figured out how to do it. Then we switched to replicating online things which were creating obvious value in the physical world and we managed to replicate that online. There was a bookstore and Amazon took the bookstore online and we replicated things in the fields which were relatively open to competition, not terribly regulated and so on. And this was stage two, I guess. Probably they happened practically uh, parallelly but it helps me to think about it like that. Then the third stage is uh, when we moved, uh, when we're moving now, and this is what happens now, to the fields which have uh, lots of state presence, lots of regulation, lots of law, and so they're just, these are more conservative systems which we are, some of us are redesigning now. It's, there's things which are uh, linked to health, things which are linked to money, things which are linked to security, and things which are linked to uh, political power. It's probably not bad that these things are so conservative and not easy to, uh, to change, because uh, this is what helps us as societies to, to move for forward, but also sort of prevents us from undertaking probably too wild experiments, and this is the stage we are at. So for me, the question is what comes next, and what comes next is, uh, this is a picture from the, from the film Her, and uh, the technology as represented in this film deals with something completely different. It's not about the, uh, the different layers of how the society is organized, but it's about how we feel ourselves, how we interact with the others, what technology help, can help us achieve on the emotional level, on the level of our social engagements, and so on. These are my parents, uh, and uh, uh, they're alive and relatively well, and I value my relationship with them. And, uh, but it's imperfect. So I started thinking what could be done in terms of digital technologies to make, to make this relationship more satisfying for myself and for them, and more, uh, more deep, more important, uh, and so on. And by, by, by speaking about this, I don't mean you know, a reminder which will tell me to buy socks for my father for, for the New Year celebration or, or for his birthday, but something a bit more meaningful. And I was thinking about it when I was uh, living in America and I was having, twice a week I talked to, to my father 
over Skype because he uses Skype. And uh, he's sort of a tough, tough person who, who in general is not very, uh, very talkative about his uh, sentiments, but especially when it happens online, she just completely uh, freezes and sort of how are things, everything is fine. How do you feel yourself? Better and better every day. So it's not, it's not really uh, moving forward. So I started thinking about what could it be that will change my, not change, but give additional depth to my relationship with him because I know that sooner or later uh, he'll be dead and I'll be very sorry that I didn't use this time we had together on earth to, to make it a more meaningful for him and for myself. And I have with the son's guilt, as I guess the, most of us have. So I, I thought what, what could be done technologically to, 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 to somehow make it, make it a little bit more important. If we manage to build something like that, then what amount of money I would be willing to pay for a better relationship with my dad? Basically, any money I have. It's, uh, it's not, it won't be a solution among other solutions. I won't be choosing between this and some other things because it's so important. So, and I thought that probably if there would have been a technology which, for example, looks at him, at his behavior on, on the Skype screen and helps me to decipher the clues in his facial expression, obviously it should be all done with his uh, agreement, I, I, I'm not going to spy on my, my own father, but, <clears throat> and probably giving him also clues about how, how I feel and what changes in me and what sort of language uh, I use now and why it's different from, from, the, uh, from the last week. It's not a substitute for, the, for a conversation. It won't be telling me how to talk to my dad, but, but probably simply giving me some clues which will help me enrich this conversation, help me understand him better, help me understand what it is to be, what is he, 87 or 89, uh, something. Sort of to the, to the previous talk we heard here. So my experience is different from his experience. How can, what could be done to, to understand him better? So, and I think that the, this emotional technology is this potentially new field which fascinates me, would be something which, which uses technology to create better emotional experiences in our interactions with people we love and uh, with our interactions with people we don't know, simply better understanding each other. Obviously, if I build such a thing for my dad, uh, I will also have to, to make one for my mom because otherwise she'll be offended. So you can imagine all, all sorts of use cases uh, and so what, what, what sort of a field is, uh, is uh, appearing in front of our eyes. This is my daughter. <coughs> She's called Mira and she moved to Tel Aviv uh, uh, six months ago and seems to be happy here. And she's another sort of uh, mm, uh, emotional or communication challenge for me because I appreciate very much, you know, watching her grow and interacting with, with herself and it's super important for me. But there are just so many things I don't know about children. I forgot how I was a child. I don't know what happens exactly at which moment with her development. I'm trying to read a, bit, a little bit about that, but I'm not professional in children's psychology. I'm not professional in, in all these numerous uh, scientific fields which uh, appear uh, around it. So I thought that probably if there is an app which, is, uh, which tells us something about our health, what if someone will build an app which will be helping us to, to understand our children better to understand our, their emotional and developmental needs there, which will be observing the data which our children generate and, and help us understand, uh, understand how we can engage with them better. It's not terribly far from the, uh, from the dangers of the surveillance state, which wants not only to know everything about us, but also wants to know aren't we about to blow a bomb or something like that. But I think that this, this could be managed if it's based on, on, on respect, if it's, if it's based on transparency, and if we, on both sides of this, understand that this leads to a better, better communication between us. This is how it all started for me, sort of thinking about this. This is a friend called Rom Roman Mazurenko. Uh, I worked with him and uh, <clears throat> We've done some interesting things together. Then he was hit by a car in Moscow and he died. And he was sort of, at, at that moment in time, he was this sort of a 
like a face of a whole generation, an incredibly beautiful, talented, uh, brilliant man uh, who died when he was, I think, 30. And we were all very much uh, grieving his death. And then uh, a common friend, my, my girlfriend at the time actually, uh, made something very strange. She, she asked us to collect all the messages we exchanged with Roman in the course of his uh, lifetime. And he, she built a very primitive uh, AI which was trying to imitate, you heard about projects like that, that was years ago, uh, trying to build uh, sort of an imitation of conversation with Roman uh, online. It was a somewhat, some people were completely offended of it by it because it, it just felt for them disrespectful, I think. I was very, very much uh, moved by this memorial in a sense because uh, Indeed, I tried several times talking to him, and I was getting this, this, the senses which were not terribly precise, sort of eerie a bit, as if com coming from, the, uh, from, from, the, from another world. But it was his voice, and I remembered these details of uh, talking to him and really sort of appreciating him, uh, him as a person. This is, for me, the, the, obviously since that time, the, the AI, this friend of mine was, uh, was building, was getting better and better and better. Now it's a startup in, in San Francisco, a relatively successful one called Replica. Uh, but it all started with uh, trying to have a meaningful memory about, uh, about someone who was so, uh, so important for us. So this is what, uh, th th these are examples of uh, of parts of our lives which we are never asked or almost never are asked to deal with as designers and product creators and so on now. But if we are lucky, some of us will be asked hopefully to deal with them as technology gets better, as, data, as we're getting more and more data, as we're building AI which will be capable of digesting this, this amounts of data and turning it into, into something meaningful, we'll be experiencing all sorts of digitally enhanced uh, uh, emotions. And that will pose interesting questions for us as uh, designers. How do you design grief? What it is that we're designing? Is there a meaningful contribution by us as product people who can change the experience of grief for, uh, for people using our products or our experiences? How do you design passion? What it is, uh, where do you start? Uh, what is passion? What is the role of, of design and experiencing passion? So these are, I don't know answers to these questions. I just think that we have this, the possibility of a rather inspiring and brilliant uh, future for the people who are doing what, 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 what we're doing because uh, of all the things we used to design uh, for the last 10, 15 years, we're dealing with a tiny little slice of human experience and will be probably called to deal with uh, a much bigger part of it so that the, uh, the design, the empathy-based design, would move and influence the experience of human life in all its forms. So this is what I wanted to share with you, and, but I would prefer to turn it into a more dialogue-based form now, if possible. <laughs> Thanks. Should I keep this? So thank you so much, Ilya, for the wonderful presentation. Would you like to join me for a conversation? Yeah. We have some questions coming in, and I also have some questions prepared. And uh, thank you so much for the wonderful discussion we also had prior to this. Here? Yeah, we need to replace the headset as well. All right, excellent. You know, one thing that you I forgot to mention that was actually really interesting. Um, you, sa you mentioned to me that you have a degree in circus management. I am a circus Does it work? Uh, yeah, I'm a professional circus manager. <laughs> I actually studied circus management for four years, believe it or not. And uh, I'm more or less confident that I continue in this line of business all uh, my life. I see. Well, probably in <laughs> a different way, I guess, right? Um, the thing that you mentioned, I think it's... Um, I mean, actually, it was such an emotional moment for me just now when you had, like, dad as an app, and kind of opened my mind to so many things because I had my father dying, passing away two years ago. It was a very big moment for me. I, I was never expecting it to be a big moment, actually. I, was, I, always, I, mean, I always knew that something will happen, and it is happening. Uh, but I, when that happened, it was like uh, exactly what you said. There were so many emotions that I went through in terms of if I had 
maybe made a better use of the time that we spent and all the things. So why do you think that is, that we are maybe so obsessed with the next social network application and the next product you know, for online banking and all that, but this emotional part is kind of, I don't see a lot of application in, applications in that space. Oh, there are, there are none. The, 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 the things I was talking about are uh, provocations. It's not, I don't actually, uh, I'm, I'm having a small startup now which is dealing with a tiny little slice of it, right. but uh, I think that the, uh, uh, it's, it's because it's hard to discover a new field. It's because it's uh, uh, all those, why didn't no one think about that this before, you know, this kind of conversations which we're hearing all the time. It's right right here, right in front of us, and I think that the there will be a lot of uh, monetary value extracted from these things because we'll pay crazy amounts of money to have our, to, uh, to, to, make our to make us happier, more content, and so, and so on. So cap capitalism will help. But I think that also technology is only now starting to slowly approaching this, uh, this kinds of uh, uh, the technological possibilities. But I guess that we as product people have to sort of dream up the ideas mm -hmm. which, the, uh, which then the technology will help us uh, realize. Technology was leading before up to, up to now. I think that we are moving into a territory where design or product creation, empathy-based sort of view, view of the world would, right. be, would be living at least parts of the, 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 the bigger field of innovation. Yeah, I think it's one thing that I always struggle a little bit is uh, I live now in Berlin and there is, in Germany in general, there is a lot of reluctance of giving data away, especially this kind of sensitive data about your close friends, your relatives, you know, these emotions. It's even sometimes people would not take a photo with the camera, uh, well, with the, you know, with an iPhone or Android device. They would rather keep it on a, you know, on their own Sony camera or whatever it is that they're using. It's actually an important thing. So there are always some privacy considerations or Mm, kind of my private data is very important to me kind of thing. So how can we get to the position where we can say, okay, this is an app that we can trust with this kind of information and with this kind of, um, I don't know, memories and all that. Can we even trust apps to the point that we can say, okay, Amotech is a thing and we can, we can comfortably use it? What do you think? I think it's a trade-off. Uh, so obviously there is a legal and technological side of it. I'm, uh, I'm a specialist in neither, so I don't know how to regulate the space, but I think it's a trade-off. Uh, you go to a doctor and this doctor learns very, very, very intimate details about you, and then the doctor tells you to use a specific device on your body which will be tra transmitting your body data to, uh, to a hospital. And uh, though it, you might feel that, you know, there are all these privacy issues, but on the other, on the other hand, and the, what you're getting for sharing this information is that you'll be alive. So probably it's, it, makes, <laughs> it makes sense. So obviously we should, we should strive for building a transparent way of managing data and protecting the, the users from all sorts of malevolent actors. But in the end, it's, you know, if you live with someone, the someone will know very, very intimate things, uh, how many times a night you go to the toilet. They'll know things about you which you don't know about yourself. It's a trade-off you pay it for, for the privilege of having a relationship with someone and having right. someone, someone on your side. It's, it's the same thing. Uh, it's the same thing here. It's it's almost unavoidable when you know this, the, the the story you shared about your uh, your father. Data privacy, if you can, if you if you if you think about this, this years before that would have would have not been. It would have been there, but it would have, would have not been the principal concern about mm -hmm. managing the relationship so important for you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there are some really great questions that come in the chat, and thank you so much for participating, by the way. I'm going to um, make an effort to bring your questions before mine. Um, so there is a question that came up. How do we approach emotional design while in the past 20 years our emotional perception has changed due to the digital era, when everyone is more individual, and especially after COVID-19, which increased the digital solitude? I don't think... Uh uh, in, in a Russian novel, uh, Master and Margarita, there is a, there is a, a scene in Circus, by the way, uh, where How the where magical is. cat looks at the at the at the audience, 
and so it happens after the Russian Revolution, and the cat says, well, the people are the same, only the, the only real estate change, uh, the real estate problem changed them, uh, changed them a bit to the worse. So I don't think that despite all of that, and it's interesting to speculate what, what, what's changing in the society, which what changes in each one of us because of COVID, because of digital, because of social media and so on. But I think that the, we shouldn't sort of lose, uh, lose uh, from you the fact that we're still human and that uh, we can still read 19th century, at least many of us can still read 19th century uh, novels about uh, love, death, war, and so on. So, so I think that the, 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 for me, the real challenge here is that we don't really have a design language to, to, to talk about these things. Mm -hmm. We have the language of psychotherapy, uh, probably. We have the language which we can borrow from the all sorts of um, uh, applications we have been building so far, but we will, we will need to develop an analytical design language to describe this, uh, this thing. What is an interface to manage love? <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, I mean, I'm very actually just uh, excited and in may we anticipate just how we will be solving, or kind of trying, to, I'm not solving, but addressing this issue. Um, one more question that just came up. What is the biggest barrier to acceptance in your view? Would your father opt in? Uh, yeah, I think so. I think that if, if we can build such a thing and uh, uh, if I can, I will probably have to lead him on this because I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm, a, I'm an early adopter and he's, uh, he's more conservative. But, uh, but I think that the, uh, the, the, if the benefits of this thing are obvious for him, I. I just can't imagine that, uh, you know, sometimes I get drunk with, together with him and we're having this more intimate conversation. So uh, a bottle of water. Is it a recommendation? A, sorry? Sorry? Is it a recommendation? Uh, no, I think that each one of us has one's own traditional methods, but sort of a bottle of vodka on the table is probably a facilitator of connection <laughs> in this particular case. It's just a different technology. Right, right. <laughs> Makes sense. Well, there is a note, it's more like a note than a question that uh, somebody will appreciate an app that can explain emotions, my emotions to my husband. Um, <laughs> I can understand that. I would that. need an app which would explain my own emotions to myself sometimes. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, I'm terrified by this vision where we lose our human ability and motivation to get to know our loved ones and connecting with them and giving machines and their owners control over our emotional state. The road to harmful manipulation is very short. It is. Uh, it is. It, it, it is a dangerous territory, and I'm not at all. I don't know how we will manage that. I can't imagine that we won't move in this space. So there is no way we'll prevent technology from uh, from be, being introduced into into the space. So I would rather try to be in control of this process and sort of proactively try to research it and in investigate it and figure out the dangers and try to mitigate them. The the Technology lived, lead to things which no one, as you know, the thought about uh, sort of nice people who started this little apps to chat about um, unimportant things on campus didn't think that it would lead to Donald Trump and so on. The, uh, uh, so we, we don't know, but it, it just means that we have to be engaged and we have to, to, to think about it and have conversations, conversations like that doesn't make me, it's, it's not that I'm so enthused about this that I think that machines will make our, uh, machines will make us better on, our, uh, on itself, of course not. But might we use technology to improve something in a human condition? Well, history is full of examples when it was uh, happening. History is also full of examples of when technology led to, to horrible things. So we have to uh, be there and try to influence the process. Talking about horrible things, I have a perfect question for you <laughs> as well. Um, metaverse, right? Uh, yeah, there is horrible um, thing, let's move on. Yes, yes, so maybe that's also one of the last questions that we have. But um, <laughs> the question there is, so do you think that, I mean, given that most of the time we're spending not, again, kind of sp uh, speaking or designing for emotions, trying to think about Amotec, um, what do you think is actually going on in digital now? Is metaverse the thing? Are we doomed in digital? Question mark. An exclamation mark now, <laughs> I can see. 
You know, a friend of mine uh, who is a curator in the Design Museum in London, uh, he had this wonderful show a couple of years ago called California on the history of Californian design, and I went there, and there was the Wired magazine from 1989, I think, on, on display, as well as pictures of Grateful Dead and all the other things which probably half of the audience uh, uh, don't know what it was. But I remembered uh, the, the more idealistic uh, times when we expected great and utopian things, which now sound super naive coming from, from technology. We now look at the digital technologies primarily as this frightening, uncontrollable beast which you know squeezes itself in all fields of our life it leads to unexpected consequences many of them are truly terrifying and so on but does it mean that we should discount the possibility of technologies altogether because sometimes it, it leads to, to bad things I, I don't think so I think that the if we can uh, that we, we should keep the possibility of a more optimistic future and we should, we should w work on it rather than just trying to prevent progress, uh, progress from, uh, uh, from happening. So uh, for me, the, the, remember these this things when, you know, approaching, some of you remember these things, uh, when approaching a computer was, was a moment of wonder. The first iPhone was a wonder. Uh, all these magical things which were truly amazing and, and, and we played with them like, uh, like children. Now, could we recreate some of these emotions or create new emotions like that, new experiences by using digital technologies? Of course we can. So, so and the fact that, uh, that, that there is this other dark side of the, of, of, of the digital technologies, uh, I, I, I don't think it should, that, that because of that we should forget about all the great things it, it, it enables us to create. Um, exciting. Uh, so do you think that you will be continuing your adventures in circus management? I am a circus manager by training. I'm a professional circus manager. I'm not going to leave. <laughs> um, that sounds <laughs> good. So, so I'm very excited how it's going to impact the work that you'll be doing <laughs> in the future as well. Uh, but we are a little bit short on time, I guess, at this point. So if you have any questions to Ilya, I think that you maybe also will be available for the questions outside uh, after, uh, well, in the next break, right? So with this in mind, please give a warm round of applause to Ilya. Thank you. Oh, what?